Good morning again. If you can find a seat, you can sit next to your new friend if you want. Everyone at Mill City is on their best behavior because that's the quickest they've quieted down in a long time. <laughs> hey, uh, good morning and welcome to Mill City one more time. My name is Stephanie. I'm the lead pastor here at Mill City, and we are so honored to be able to have any of you who are visiting here for one of the first few times, and we're deeply honored to have everybody here from Elam Church. Thanks for trusting us and coming this morning. We're so glad that you're here. Um, I want to just pray, and then I'm going to actually invite Pastor Paul up, and we're going to share a little bit before we get into the scripture together. So will you join me in prayer? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it's very evident that you are present in this room and you are present in this place. God, we thank you for this school and for the hospitality that's been extended to our community. And we pray that your Holy Spirit wouldn't just be with us here now, that it would remain here in this school all week long and would make a difference in the lives of the students and the staff and the, and the faculty and the teachers. God, we thank you for their hospitality. Would you bless them in the name of Jesus? And God, we pray that this morning as we look at your word and as we talk about being a Jesus-centered church, that Jesus, you'd be forming us to be more and more like you. We thank you for the opportunity to, to physically display that there is only one church of Jesus. And we're thankful that we have this one location today. And God, we just pray that you would inhabit our praises and you would be present with us and that your Holy Spirit would be the one that's speaking through your word today to each one of us and that we would leave here different than when we came in. We thank you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Pastor Paul, come on up. <laughs> Pastor Paul and I have gotten to know each other pretty well over the last five years and really well over the last few months. I brought a picture of your family. Check this out. There Do, we are. It was on the internet. Do you want to know another picture that was on the internet? <laughs> that one of you. Yes. <laughs> Corn. You guys put that on the internet, so like that's, that's out there. Fair game. Don't start it's looking at game. pictures of me on the internet. It's, <laughs> it's a long rabbit trail. But um, we're so grateful you're here. Uh, I want to just give a quick kind of what is going on. If anybody is here and you're realizing it seems a little more full in here today, as we described, Elam Church is here worshiping with us. Mm -hmm. We're discerning an adoption merger. Um, we have written a lot about it and have it on our website. We would love for you to read about that if you're visiting with Mill City or kind of getting connected with us. We believe this is something that the Holy Spirit is doing, and we're just trying to figure out how to respond. Yeah. Amen. That's what we're about. And so this is a great opportunity for us to get to know each other. And so I invited Pastor Paul to come up and just share a little bit about Elam. And then um, we'll kind of just give you a sense of connection. But my first question is, what is the skill oh. that you're grateful yeah. that you have? Uh, I'm really good at staying up late. So that's good. <laughs> okay, wait. <laughs> but it, as you know, it's probably bad when it comes to Sunday morning. How late uh, did you stay up last night? Uh, just Well, actually, I went to bed. At, on a in a responsible manner at like 10 o'clock okay and so then I woke up at 3 a.m. I was like what am and I you've doing been up since what am I doing and I've kind of been up since so all right no wonder you I were like <laughs> shredding on the guitar during practice you're just trying to yeah. stay awake okay uh, yeah so, so it's, it's kind it's, of like a skill that's like a blessing and yeah. a curse yeah it's great but sometimes uh, you know it kick you in the butt <laughs> <laughs> would you share just a little bit especially for the Mill City folks here um, if you know there's a long history of Elam so it's not doing it justice to ask you to give just a quick <laughs> snapshot yeah. but snapshot and and current just whatever you would like to share so that folks yep. can feel like they can get to know Elam a little bit yeah so I came to Elam five and a half years ago mm -hmm. and Elam is one of the oldest churches in our denomination and one of the oldest churches in in the city here yep uh, we've been going uh, we're in our 134th year uh, coming up to 135. Praise God, yeah. right? Praise the Lord. Yeah. Talk about faithfulness of God. <laughs> and in the mid-1800s, when Swedish immigrants left Europe because of religious, economic persecution and oppression, they, came, they wanted to find a place where they could rest. Mm. And Elam became that name for them because Elam is a place in the Bible from Exodus chapter 15 where people uh, came out of Egypt, went across the river, they sang their great song with Miriam, and then they rested at Elam, a place of 12 wells and 70 palms. Mm. And so Elam has been uh, desirous to be a place of rest and, and refreshment in the city for, for 135, almost 135 years. Wow. And, and 
these folks wanted to be able to worship God in their language, in That's Swedish. Right. And it reminds me of, uh, here at Mill City, we have a church plant that we're so honored to be able to host, Espiritu Santo. And they're in the same spot here saying they want to worship Jesus in Spanish, their heart language. And so they've been reminding me and making me think about these folks in the late 1800s who just wanted to be able to worship Jesus in Swedish. Yeah. And they got to do that because of people who were faithful to start Elam Church. So how would you describe Elam now? Uh, Elam, uh, for the past 30 or 40 years, has engaged in some really wonderful ministries yeah. to folks experiencing homelessness through starting one of the first transitional housing programs in the whole country wow. called Elam Transitional Housing back in the 80s and 90s. Wow. And of recent, um, our, our group and some of you have participated in Hope Avenue and outreach to people experiencing homelessness. Our church was also the first church in the 90s to uh, hire a female lead pastor. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> and um, so that is a value of ours, yeah. uh, that, that folks, uh, male and female, equally called to do the work of God. And so we continue to practice that today, and uh, that is a value of ours. So today, Elam is, we are at a point uh, after the pandemic of really of discernment, like uh, Adobe said earlier, a place of discernment where we are asking God, what is next? Yeah. Um, we just went through the Experiencing God study, and Experiencing God teaches you to look around and say, where is God at, and how can you join him? Yeah. And uh, I know that is a value here at Mill City as yeah. well. And so we have been praying, seeking God. We've been fasting. We've been, we've been really working hard to say, what is next for us? Um, and when we look at Mill City Church, we just see a church full and alive of people that are following Jesus. And... Um, so you, got, you all have, uh, your uh, rep reputation has preceded you. So uh, you're, you're an amazing group, and we're just so glad to be here with you today. We're honored to have you and uh, just really honored to be considered in this way. So thank you for that. Um, we have, we, as Doby mentioned, there's, there's donuts, but come for the people too. You know, yeah. and, like, and so you'll, you'll get instructions how to get down there. But we would just love some time to connect and maybe just a little bit more time to hear if there's questions people have for Pastor Paul or others from the leaders here at Elam. Um, that would be a great time to do that. And then yeah. Adobe mentioned the two times for Mill City folks to gather. Elam folks have similar times to gather. We really value your participation. Yeah. If we didn't believe that God was doing something here and that it could be something where there's a greater kingdom impact together than apart, we wouldn't be leading you in this way and encouraging you to consider this. And so... Let's be honest, like that's where we're leaning. Like we feel like God's in this. However, we're not doing it without you guys. Like, I mean, come on. Like if it's not where you are feeling, we need to hear from you. We want to know what you're feeling, your questions. Some of you have been so honest and lovely in how you've brought those questions. And some of you have shared how just excited you are. I want the Elam people to know that generally speaking, Mill City is super honored and excited to be in this conversation with you. We're very excited. So you can feel encouraged in that. Um, however, we're seeking and praying. And so we, like Adobe said, we believe that God speaks to all of us. And so we're grateful that you're trusting us in the process, but we trust you in this process now. And so we're here for that and, and all that. Did we say we were going to say anything else? I don't remember. Um, I think that I was just hope one. everybody's awake by now. Woo! Right? We had an extra Woo! hour of sleep. I, yeah. Is everybody Thank awake? Thank goodness. We're up. Everybody, we're okay. <laughs> um, We're in a conversation here at Mill City called Jesus Centered Church. Um, and both of our churches are Jesus-centered churches, living into what it looks like to follow Jesus, the words of Jesus, the ways of Jesus, and how can we be people who li even live into the works of Jesus and the incredible things that he did and he sends us to do in the world. Paul, this first century leader in the church, is writing this letter to the church in Ephesus, and that, that letter, people say, went all over the ancient Near East to many different churches. I like to think of it as the first time something went viral. I mean, I'm just saying. Yeah. And... Yeah. We've been having different people read the passage, and I thought it was fun today to have Pastor Paul read the passage, also because your name's Paul. I don't hey. think anyone else named Paul has read Paul. Anyway, <laughs> why don't you read? This is one of my right. favorite parts of Ephesians, and then I'll, I'll talk through it this morning. All right. So you're, you're going to be preaching on 11 through 13, Yep. Right? Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. Is it okay if I read first three as well? And just you know before what? that? I received that. Okay. That. Okay. That. I love this. Okay. This is... This is <laughs> We've gotten to be good friends, so I'm like, whatever. Okay. Yes, you do this. Here, here's the word of God to us today. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Mm. Listen, there is one body. There is one Spirit. Just as you were called to one hope when you were called one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. I'm going to skip down to verse 11. So Christ himself 
gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Thank you. Thank you. Thankful for you and for your wife. Can we just thank Paul for being here? Where are they? there? Somewhere here. I saw her. I saw her. Well, as we're going through here, we're, we're focusing in, we're going to zero in on those five gifts that you heard listed. Christ himself, Jesus himself, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors. I like to use the word shepherd there. It's a little bit more helpful in my opinion. The, the shepherds and the teachers. These important gifts are given to the church by Jesus himself so that, and we saw that right there in, in the passage, the church can grow to be all that God has for us, right? To be built up, to reach unity and maturity and the fullness of Christ. Can you just imagine what would it be like to be experiencing the fullness of Christ? Look at how Eugene Peterson phrases it in the, in the message paraphrase. This is what he says. He, Jesus, handed out the gifts above and below, filled heaven with his gifts, filled earth with his gifts, and he handed out gifts of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor and teacher to train Christ's followers in skilled servant work, working within Christ's body, the church, until we're all moving rhythmically and easily with each other. Just picture that. We're all moving rhythmically and easy with each other, efficient and graceful in response to God's Son, fully mature adults, fully developed within and without, fully alive like Christ. It's such a good moment to say that this is aspirational, okay, <laughs> right, right? Because as the church, we know globally, not just Mill City and Elam, but we know we're not always moving rhythmically and easily with each other, right? It's not always efficient and graceful. Sometimes it's more like inefficient and clumsy. And we're just having an honest moment. And I'm sure this was true of the church in Ephesus, and all these churches that were reading these letters from Paul, they, they knew they hadn't arrived. They, that wasn't the point. Paul is giving this invitation to them. And later in verse 16, he just says, From Jesus, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love. As each part, everyone, does its work. And I want us to be encouraged that Paul was casting a vision that we aspire towards, that in a lot of ways it can feel like, oh, I just wish we could arrive, but instead we can look at it as something we can always be pursuing. And what I think is, is true here is that Paul acknowledges that this is not magical, this is not automatic, but that it's a process and that it's for everyone. There's four little words that I think make it clear that Paul is saying this is a process and it's for everyone. And it's these little words right in verse 13, until we all reach, until we all reach, Unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. I mean, I think you could sneak in there and sometimes you'll become a little mature. Then you'll backtrack a little. But that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> We're going to continue to move forward, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So can we take encouragement in the phrase, until we all reach? That little phrase tells us it's a process and that it's for everyone. So I'm going to put up on the screen my big takeaway for us today, and it's this. A Jesus-centered church grows towards unity and maturity when everyone uses the gifts Jesus has given them. A Jesus-centered church grows towards unity and maturity when everyone uses the gifts Jesus has given them. Now, I can tell just from up here that this is a skilled group of people, right? You named some skills, except for the people who are like, I don't care what question they ask, I'm going to say what I want to talk about. But some of you answered the question, right? So I'm genuinely interested in the people who have the skill of baking. Could you raise your hands? Okay, if my husband could get those phone numbers. I'm really, I'm very interested in the results of those skills. And the, and the, the you know, I'm very interested in what comes from those skills. And I honestly don't have a lot of, like, awesome skills to offer, but I would trade 
some skills maybe for some cookies, okay? So that's where I'm at with that. I can tell that you are gifted people in a lot of different ways, that you have skills. And I know because it's a promise in Scripture that Jesus has given you gifts, that you're gifted people. God has wired you differently. We're all pretty different, right? God has wired you for specific spiritual gifts. Whether you feel like you know what those gifts are in your life because you've had a long time in your life of pursuing those gifts, whether or not it's one of those things that you used to pursue and you haven't lately, or some of you are thinking, that's kind of a new thought to me, the idea of spiritual gifts that God's given me. We all have those gifts, and God gave them to us. Jesus gave them to us because they are ways in which together we can help the church grow towards unity and maturity. They're critical. God's gifted you in ways that we need everybody to be able to help the church grow towards unity and maturity and the fullness of Jesus Christ. Here's a definition of spiritual gifts. Um, there's maybe different ones, but this is the one we can share today. A God-given gift or skill that enables someone or empowers someone to perform a specific function of the body of Christ with effectiveness and ease. Effectiveness and ease. Because a Jesus-centered church only grows towards unity and maturity when everyone uses their gifts, it's important that we all ask the question, what are those gifts that I have? And how might they be used? And that's a question we ask regularly as things are changing. Because, I don't know, things are always changing, aren't they? Someone's like, wait, hold on. Warn me before you say that. Like, give me a warning. Things are always changing. Like, we live in a world that's constantly changing. The last 134 years of Elam Church, let's talk about those changes, my goodness. And so, together, God gives us gifts to handle that and to move forward together. I remember growing up uh, in the 90s, it was really popular to have these really long spiritual gift inventories. Did anyone else take those? And somehow those lists sometimes had like 45 different gifts in them. Some of them I think they were making up, to be honest, okay? I'm like, is that really one of them? And sometimes I would look at the list and you'd be like, these are the ones I want to have, right? I'm hoping that this one comes up, especially like when it, one of them that's listed is celibacy. And you're like, whoa, whoa, I don't want that one. Like, that's where it goes. I mean, seriously, the things they put... The things they put in this gift list, and I'm not trying to knock them all together because sometimes they were helpful, but in this passage here in Ephesians 4, it's, it's important that we recognize that these five gifts are pulled out of the bigger list that you could have, the exhaustive list in Scripture. That one, those lists can be helpful, but here, these lists, this, this gift list in Ephesians 4 are here together very intentionally. They're a complete set of gifts, these five. They are complete in their purpose. One commentary pointed out this way of thinking of this kind of threefold purpose of these gifts. Immediate, intermediate, and ultimate. Okay? The immediate purpose to equip the church, right? To give resources to the church. To equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. The intermediate purpose of unity and maturity, right? The thing that we're in process on all the time. Until we reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. And then the ultimate purpose which is truly being the body of Jesus, living and active in the world, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. This is the threefold purpose of these gifts. So I want to suggest, and many scholars would agree, that we need to look at these gifts separate from the other ones and say, what about these five? And where are all of us in these five gifts? So what I want to do is to look at each of them just for a couple minutes each, and I want you to be thinking about how God wired you. How did God make you? And maybe you notice and resonate with some of the description that I give. Um, it's okay if you don't feel like, oh, this is exactly me. Just kind of wonder about that. I invite you into a space of curiosity about what one of these t gifts is true for you. I have noticed that most people seem to have one or two of these five gifts that kind of come to the surface. And God can equip and empower us by the power of the Holy Spirit to do any of them at any time. But that there's a wiring that we have towards maybe one or two. So as I go through, just kind of see which ones resonate with you. And I even have some really, uh, really cute little stick figure images for you, all right? It's really, some, someone was like, you were really excited about that. They're just stick figures. Like it's not, my graphic design skills is what that is. All right, the first one listed, apostle. It comes from the Greek word apostolos, meaning one who is sent out. I would say that the, the clearest way we can say what is the role of an apostle, they are the ones that move us forward. Because of the aforementioned changes we're always, always experiencing, there has to be these people that are saying we've got to keep moving forward. And these are the apostles. Uh, some of the ways we might talk about it is apostolic or leadership gifts, vision, uh, faith, 
we see these things. A description would be uh, God calls people to move forward and to follow God's lead in God's mission. And this gift aids the church in growing and changing and moving forward even when it's challenging and hard and uncomfortable. And I have gotten to know Pastor Paul long enough to know that this is one of his gifts, that he is an apostle who's willing to say, we need to move forward even when it's challenging and hard and uncomfortable because the mission of God is what's at hand. And that's what apostles bring. I like to talk about common vocations for apostles because uh, not because we uh, all people who are people who have the gift of apostles are in a job that where you see that, but it, it just kind of helps us think about it a little bit. Think about how we see this wiring that I think God has given everybody, even sometimes outside of the church in different vocations. And so the vocations I think are, are true often for apostle-type personalities are entrepreneurs, people who are explorers, maybe they're leading new initiatives in a company or innovative-type jobs. And that's what we see for this apostle, okay? And I'll bring the summary back, but we'll move on to the next one. So then the second one is prophet. This is an easy one to misunderstand because it doesn't mean the prophets that we have books of in the Old Testament. Uh, that's not what that means anymore. It simply means people who get insight from God, people who get a special insight from God. And I've met a lot of you who I know have this gift. It's from the Greek, Greek word prophetes, meaning one who hears and listens to God. One who hears and listens to God. Our God is an active God. God didn't send, set the world in motion and then say, okay, good luck, right? God is involved. Jesus incarnated coming to the earth proves that God wants to be involved. God is still speaking, using scripture and prayer and visions and all these different ways. And people who have the gift of prophet, the prophetic people, are these ones that have discernment, wisdom, they have intercession. And, and this is something God made them to be about. They're always bringing us back to the important question of what is God saying? So important to have the prophets, right? Common vocations in the world that I see people who seem to be kind of wired like prophets would be artists and musicians. Think about that for a minute. People who are kind of talking about things in this way that makes you go, whoa, wait, hold on. And they really reflect the creator of God. Uh, writers, maybe even like leadership coaches and life coaches that kind of have a sense to kind of how to help people think about where they're going in their life. Th just for example. So that's the prophet. The next one is the evangelist. Here's another one that we can get kind of caught up in because we picture like a certain person who has a microphone who's giving a talk to a big group of people. Does anyone else think of that when you hear the word evangelist? Just to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. Here in this passage, remember, this is in the first century. They weren't thinking of people who had a missions organization and they spoke in, in a, to a large group through a microphone, right? They were talking about the wiring of certain people to want to bring people in. People who draw in other people towards Jesus, towards community, towards a life of faith. It comes from this Greek word evangelestis, meaning one who brings good news. One who brings good news. And that is a gift that I see in so many of you. And that doesn't mean we're going to make you talk in a microphone to a large group of people. You're welcome. But that doesn't mean that's not your gift. And that might happen in really kind and quiet ways, depending on your personality with people in your life. The evangelists draw other people in. The last command we see given by Jesus is to go and make disciples, right? To get more people involved. And to do that, we have to have new people come in and join. And this is a gift that God has given people that helps show people and draw people that what it looks like to have a relationship with God and to be a part of a church community and what that might mean for them. These are people who think about that a lot naturally. Common vocations for evangelists, and I mean this in a positive way, is like sales. People who are like, I love this product, I want people to use it, right? Like you can see that personality type. People in the hospitality industry who love to create a place where people want to come in. Uh, folks who are in marketing or media or want to tell a story really well. Writers sometimes that are storytellers. These types of folks are often evangelists. The fourth one, you still with me? We're on number four. All right, cool. The fourth one is shepherd. I like to use the word shepherd um, instead of pastor because I think that's a little bit closer to the way that they're talking about this in the passage from the Greek poimen, meaning one who shepherds God's people. That's the literal word, so that's why I like to use that shepherd instead of pastor. One who shepherds God's people. Shepherding, empathy, encouragement, helping, healing. This is about supporting people. Caring well for other people. Anyone else in right now just want to say I'm so thankful for the shepherding people in my life, right? 
And all the gifts are important, but man, we need to be cared for, don't we? We're so thankful for the shepherds. They're the people who say, we need to look out for the needs of everybody. And it's impossible to meet all the needs, but they're going to keep trying, aren't they? And they're not going to stop. These are the people who are strong in these gifts to make sure that everyone is taken care of to the best of our ability. One of the vocations, like some of the vocations we see here often for shepherds are the helping professions, of course. Um, nursing, healthcare, um, people who are in social work, counseling, things like that. Once again, many people with that gift are not in that vocation, but you can see that wiring, right? And then finally we have teacher. Teacher. Comes from the Greek word didaskalos, meaning one who seeks and shares truth. One who seeks and shares truth. Some of you know you're these types of people. These are people who teach God's truth. And truth can be found in so many different fields, can't it? Isn't it amazing how God created this world with all these truths we can discover about the universe that to the point that it's so complex that we'll never figure it all out? Only God knows. I love that. I think that that's so amazing. And also, even the teaching of, of Scripture and trying to dig into what God's Word means, seeking after knowledge. Some of you know you're wired that way. You just love, like, like right now, if I get too boring, you're going to be on Wikipedia. Like, that's where you're going to be because you love learning. And, and that's good. That's how God made your, your brain. And you love to share it and explain that to other people. That's what the teachers do. Teachers bring clarity. They bring understanding. God loves to reveal God's self. Isn't that a cool thing about who God is? That God wants to reveal God's self to us. God gifted certain people in helping to teach the truth about the world and about God so that we can apply it to our lives, so that we can be empowered and transformed and changed and be more like Jesus. So common vocations for teachers and teaching gifts, of course, teachers, right? <laughs> Educators, trainers, maybe like systems managers who like to figure something out and help other people be able to do that. So those, those are the, the short summary of these five gifts, and you could go deep dive on all of them. So look at the summary of all my little stick figures. Put them on my little stick figures up there. They're so cute. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, teacher, moving us forward, giving us insight from God, bringing people in, supporting other people, and teaching truth. Do you see how much we need every single one of these gifts? And what would happen if we just didn't have anybody with one of them? And what would happen if some people don't move closer towards the gift that God's given them and thus we don't have everybody who's a teacher and everybody who's a shepherd stepping into the gifts that they have, both for the church community, the local church communities, but also for the church big C as we step into our everyday spaces where we live and work and play and learn. God's gifted you to be people, to be the church in those spaces, but also to be the church as you, you come around each other and say, hey, my gifting helps us move forward. My gifting helps us to seek out what is it that God is saying. My gifting is one that helps us support each other and make sure everyone's cared for along the way. My gifting is one that makes sure that other people join in so that we've got more folks that get to be a part of this. And then we, my gift is being able to explain well what's happening now, what's happened in the past, where we're going, what is, well, how do we understand God. These gifts all matter so much, don't they? And I just love seeing that and I love looking for these gifts in all of you as I get to know you. I hope you can look at that and you can see why we need them all. I mean, what would happen if all of a sudden there were no shepherds? There would not be donuts probably, like, because that's, like, loving, right? No, there would be so many care ministries and things that wouldn't happen that people desperately need. What ha would happen if there was no prophets that were constantly saying, even though it's hard sometimes, right? But what is God saying? I know we're scared, but what is God saying? Or I know that you're ready to, with your cool plan, but what is God saying? But we need that, right? What would happen if any one of these gifts were not a part of the whole? So I'm going to tell a quick story. Some of you know that I, I deeply love my niece and nephew, Amos and Mabel. Um, they, I, I like to rub it in that they look a lot more like me than their parents. I'm so sorry. Um, this is a total digression from my sermon for a second, but... People who know me are like, classic. Um, look at these pictures of them. I mean, this is just the cutest thing. Okay, so in the middle is my niece, Mabel, and then that's little me, and that's my brother. How cute is that, right? Like, they're just so cute. And then uh, first grade and teacher's assistant, and then that's my brother and I on my first day of, of first grade and him. It's so cute. I just love it. I just love, you know, kind of rubbing it in that they look so much like me right now and trying not to let them get too freaked out about the future and how, you know, they're going to grow up. They might look more like mom. Good for them. That'll be great. Would be really happy for them. Uh, that was my sister-in-law singing up here. Amazing. So that was a digression. Now I'll tell the story that I was actually planning on telling. 
My brother and sister-in-law are so kind to let my husband JD and I into the special moments in Amos and Mabel's life. It's such a gift to be a part of, of the lives of little kids, even when they're not your own, right? Because we just see kids. I just, I'm always thinking about how kids are the church now, right? They are not the church of the future. They're here, right? The church of the future is not yet born. Like, they're here now. And I love the certain kids that I get to be in their life a little bit more. And my niece and nephew are two of those kids. And uh, since my husband and I aren't having our own kids, we really cherish the special times that we get to have with Amos and Mabel. And one of our favorite times is Christmas morning when they open their gifts. And you could just see how mom and dad might want to have the kids all to themselves. But they invite Auntie Steph and Uncle JD to come and have these moments. And maybe I pick out matching pajamas, like stuff like that. And I just love them so much. So many of you have experienced Christmas morning with kids, and if you haven't, there's kind of a universal experience in many ways, especially kind of in dominant North American culture. There's an experience that many people have, right? And that is that either Christmas Eve or Christmas morning, the kids get some gifts, they open the gifts, and because many of the kids are very loved, they have more than one gift, right, that they get to open. And because of that, they often will have maybe one toy that they like to play with on Christmas Day, maybe another one later that week, maybe a couple that make it a couple months, but then parents, correct me if I'm wrong, after a while, here we are in November, it's almost the holidays again, how many of those kids are still daily playing with those toys from last Christmas, right? Lots of them are on the shelf, right, collecting dust, some of them are in a closet, because kids are, that's just how kids are wired, and I think it's so cute. Um, but it's also sometimes, like, annoying, right? You're like, ah, I thought you'd want to play with that for at least two years, right? But they, they just love these new things, and they open up these gifts. And so this is just a funny, cute thing about kids. But I want to suggest that sometimes we are all like kids in that way. And what I mean by that is that even though we're adults, we're like the kids in that God has given us these gifts that have great potential to give us joy, <laughs> And great potential to give us meaning in life. And unlike a toy, they're actually really important and have a really important purpose in our lives. And I think there's times in many of us in our lives when the spiritual gifts in general, and maybe these specific gifts here in Ephesians 4, can get kind of left on the proverbial shelf. And they start to like collect dust, metaphorically speaking. Or they're kind of shoved in a closet for different reasons. And sometimes it's just because of the busyness of life. Sometimes it's because people really did not affirm you very well in those gifts. I'm sorry about that. And sometimes it's because it was just kind of hard to know where those gifts fit. There's lots of reasons, so don't have shame about that. I just wonder if sometimes we're those people who put those gifts somewhere and we don't even realize we kind of left them on the shelf, like the kids who forgot about their Christmas gifts from last Christmas. Others of you have been living so deeply into these gifts, and I want you to know that at both of our churches, like, we see that. We're so thankful for that. I think sometimes the gifts inside the church especially are kind of the 80-20 principle. If people heard about the 80-20 principle? It's kind of like 20% of the people are using their gifts to do 80% of all the things. And this is just very common. This is not something specific to our churches. But these gifts were meant to, to build up the church and empower us to live on mission as the body of Christ wherever we go in our everyday spaces, loving communities in the name of Jesus. And if you know as I'm talking about this, that it might be time to dust off one of those gifts that's on the shelf. Would you consider that this morning? Maybe you're just at the beginning of exploring those gifts, and I just want to encourage you to dig into it. And it, it's not because, of course, I'd love the 80-20 rule to be flipped, right? Wouldn't it be great if, like, 80% of the people were using their gifts, and that meant that everybody shared more of the, like, that's, that's fine. That's not actually my, the reason I'm encouraging you. My motivation for encouraging you to explore your gifts is this. Some of you know how awesome it feels to use your God-given gifts, don't you? It's an amazing feeling to do things that you know it matters to the church community. It matters to God's mission in the world when you're living into the gifts that God has given you. And I know how awesome that feels. I also know how important it is to feel needed. You matter. Your gifts matter. And as a pastor and as a leader, I just want that experience for you. I want you to experience the joy of living into that gift and those gifts that God has given you. And for you to know that you're so impart and such an important part of the whole. God created us for belonging and purpose. And I believe that that has so much to do with these gifts that we have. 
Look at this definition of the spiritual gift again. A God-given gift or skill that enables someone to perform a specific function of the body of Christ with effectiveness and ease. Here's something that's true. It doesn't always feel like ease at first, does it? Sometimes it doesn't feel like that right away. It takes a little bit of practice. Also, it's sometimes difficult to figure out exactly where your gifts fit in the church or on mission because things are changing constantly. And so I get that that's frustrating somehow. It's kind of like, well, I don't know, I took the assessment and it says I'm a teacher. Where's the conveyor belt that we're putting the teachers on so I can get put in the, in the thing? Like, the church is an organism. It's not an Amazon warehouse. Like, right? Like, this isn't how it works. But it's challenging sometimes, right, to know exactly where our gifts fit. It takes time. It takes wisdom. It takes experimenting. And it takes a commitment by all of you to be, have perseverance yourself, but also to be looking for the gifts of other people. Because the truth is, is a lot of these gifts are not just for programs in the church. They're for the church as a community. They're not just for leading a class, being a teacher, but someone who can lean over to someone and be like, oh, let me tell you something I learned. Right? It doesn't always have to fit into programs. That's not, that's not what Paul was saying, right? Like he wasn't like, if you could sign up on the clipboard in the back after this letter's read here. Like that wasn't happening in the first century. People were stepping into their gifts all around. The church is a body. It's not a machine. And when we make a commitment to explore our gifts, to commit to community, to have an open mind and to bring our whole selves, I really believe that we can all be moving towards that idea of reaching unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and becoming mature and attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. I do have, I know I was teasing about the inventories before, but I do actually have like a little quiz you can take online about these five gifts, and I put it on millcitychurch.com slash blog. And tells you more all about them. And so if you want to dig into that, I really would love for you to just try to identify what your top one or two gifts might be. And as I close, I'll invite the worship team to come up. But I just want to, I want to share with all of you, just from my heart. It's never felt more important to me as a pastor of Mill City Church that we all step into our gifts right now. I think about all of you at Elam and all of us at Mill City and how critical it is, even in just this discernment phase, for us to bring all these gifts to the, to the table in every space we can. Do you see how we have apostles that can imagine the future? Prophets that continue to help us to point back to what God is saying? Evangelists that get more people involved in the process? Shepherds, you are really needed because there's a lot of challenges and grief and feelings. People are all up in their feelings. Not me. I, I'm fine. No, it's not. It's hard, right? Like we're in, we need the shepherds. This is really challenging. And we need the teachers who help us come back to the details and, and help people understand the process. Do you see how much we need these folks? But remember, because we're wired differently, we're going to have a different experience. The apostles are like, this process seems really slow. Right? And the shepherds are like, slow it down, slow, maybe two years. That would be good. We can care for everybody. Because we're wired differently. And that's okay. That's why we need each other in this process. Paul was encouraging the church in Ephesus. Not because the church is the final goal. This is so important, you guys. The church being built up to maturity and unity is not just for us, but for the sake of the world that God loves. It's not about us. It's about this community and about this faith, but it's ultimately the church is not an end, but a means to God's end. A healthy, thriving, Jesus-centered church is not the end, but a means to an end, which is joining in what God is doing all around us as God's kingdom comes in our midst. And that kingdom impact is why the church exists. And that's why we all need to bring our gifts to the table. That's what's at stake if we don't dust off those gifts that have been on the shelf. A Jesus-centered church grows towards unity and maturity when everyone uses the gifts Jesus has given them. And God's heart for us is to experience the fullness of Christ. To experience the fullness so that we can be poured out to the people around us who desperately need to know that they are loved and they are seen and they matter starting with the people in our own community and the people that we encounter every day, the people in the church and the people who have still yet to experience the love of Jesus in their life. We are filled with the full measure of Christ so we can overflow with that love to the world around us. And so your gifts are needed and your gifts are needed and your gifts are needed. That's what this is all about. I'm gonna just put some questions I want you to take with you into this week. 
Am I daily receiving the love Jesus has for me so I can be full? What are the gifts that Jesus has given you? And do any of them need to be dusted off? Because we need you. You matter. Your gifts matter. This is going to be hard. This is going to be challenging. But God is with us, and we're in it together. No matter what happens, we're still going to be loving Northeast Minneapolis in the name of Jesus together. Amen? Let's go into this time of worship.